I always look forward to Reverend John's message. And this morning, I'm looking forward to what he has to say about how you can live the science of mind. This is sure to be both a refresher and some new information for us. And of course, you're always going to be getting that assignment of yours. Reverend John. Thank you, Reverend Michael. Thank you so much, Reverend Michael. Morning, family. And welcome to our beautiful Temple of Light. And those who watch us on the World Wide Web or listen in, uh, it's nice and warm down here. So if you get a chance, come on down. And thank you for tuning in. It's really wonderful to be sharing this morning. Um, I was at a, a meeting of the Thriving Ministry group. And there are four quadrants, one of which uh, is working on consciousness raising. And Cassandra Scott, who is in that um, group, said, you know, how, you know how you see Orthodox Christians going to, to church every Sunday with them Bible under them? Uh -huh. Wouldn't it be wonderful if everybody came to the temple carrying the Science of Mind textbook? And we need to, we need to, to she said, talk a, a bit more about, about the Science of Mind textbook. So my talk this morning is, you can live the science of mind, not just in the textbook, but in your life and in your affairs. When I was studying for the ministry, I one day confessed to Reverend Elmer that I really am not a reader. You know, you know one of those people who seem always to be devouring a book? Our own Reverend Anne Shand has her nose in a book whenever she has a spare moment, which is not often, I mark you. But I so admire her diligent pursuit of truth. Anyway, continuing my unburdening to Reverend Emma, I said, Reverend, take the Science of Mind textbook, for example. I've read it cover to cover umpteen times since I've been studying, and every time it's as if it's the first time I'm reading it. I feel like I'll never get it all. And besides, to tell you the truth, I'm tired to death of all the reading that's required of us. Well, instead of commiserating with me, she just chuckled, and my teacher and mentor said, you know, dear, the introduction to the textbook is actually Dr. Holmes' teaching in a nutshell. If you, read and if you read and digest those four chapters, you will be able not only to teach the science of mind, but also live it. That was all she gave me. I said, anyway, after I finish this, I am not reading another book. So what did she give me that Christmas? A leather-bound copy of the science of mind. So I've titled my talk this morning, my encouragement, you can live the science of mind. And she gave me a simple spiritual practice, which I want to share with you, because I've been using it ever since, and it really works. She said, every time you take a book off the shelf, or you take up a book to read, or even the newspaper, or watching television, simply affirm the infinite mind of God, which is my mind, reveals to me whatever I need to know and understand. The infinite mind of God, which is my mind, reveals to me whatever I need to know and understand. So the introduction to the Science of Man textbook has four sections, titled The Thing Itself, The Way It Works, What It Does, and How to Use It. And these four chapters reveal the heart of Ernest Holmes' teaching which is there is one mind, one infinite mind, from which all things come, unquote. Let me tell you what he wrote. This mind is through, in, and around man. It is the only mind there is, and every time man thinks, he uses it. There is one infinite spirit, and every time man says, I am, he proclaims it. There is one infinite substance, and every time man moves, he moves in it. Unquote. So I began reading with the consciousness that the mind of God is my mind. And as Dr. Holmes writes, and I quote, whatever is true of God, the universal, is true of man, an individualization of the universal. Whatever is true of God is true of you and me. Isn't that just a powerful thing to affirm for yourself? Whatever is true of God is true of everyone and of me. 
Let's say that to our neighbor. Whatever is true of God is true of you and me. Namaste. Whatever is true of God is true of you and me. Namaste. Whatever is true of God is true of you and me. Namaste. Whatever is true of God is true of you and me. And Holmes continues. When this truth is consciously accepted, it causes health, financial stability, good relationships, and rewarding self-expression. Our challenge is, however, to think in terms of truth, regardless of appearances that seem to contradict it." Unquote. I believe, you know, it was Winston Churchill who once said of someone, and I quote, he occasionally stumbles over the truth, but he always hastily picks himself up and hurries on as if nothing has happened. How often we stumble upon the truth and we just, because the, our lives are so full of all the angst that is, that is aimed at us from every, all the media sources and social media, we put that truth on the back burner. Many of us then, when faced with less than favorable outer conditions, simply put the truth on that back burner and say, yeah, that's all very well and good. And Reverend John says upon Sunday, but I have the rent to pay this end of month and I'm overdue. We forget that truth is always independent of all existing conditions. The truth, my friends, is not dependent upon, not dictated by the facts we see in the world. For facts are, conditions and change from moment to moment. At one time it was a fact that the earth was flat. The truth is absolute. It stands alone waiting to be known by anyone bold enough to look beyond what is visible, beyond the facts. Anyone can live at the level of appearances for it takes precious little imagination and absolutely no original thinking. On the other hand, knowing the truth is venturing into the divine the divine realm of first cause, where everything begins. That which was in the beginning, is now, and forevermore shall be. So knowing the truth is knowing what God knows. And it, it can't change. It's been so, it always has been so, and will always be so. So I want us to do something today for our, our neighbors in the United States. Let's just take a moment right now to know the truth of divine right action and divine order for the United States of America in their midterm elections this Tuesday. Can we just be silent for a moment and know that truth? Divine order for all the American nation. order. That is the truth. Regardless, the divine order, everything is unfolding for all of humanity exactly as it should. So my friends, never allow yourself to feel that the actions of others have caused you distress or some other consequence in your life. Any belief that outer conditions, whether through people or situations, can affect you is an open invitation for the illusions of pain, sickness, affliction, disease, and suffering to dwell in your body and in the body of your affairs. We, we call it to us because we pay so much attention to it. The science of mind teaches that you can only have what you are aware of and awareness is described as appreciation, comprehension, knowledge, perception, realization, and understanding. How aware are you, my friends, of resentment, hostility, animosity, irritation, and anger? How aware are you of hatred, outrage, fear, worry, or horror? How aware are you of spite, envy, rivalry, jealousy, hoarding, and greed? Is that, is that what's filling your consciousness all the time? Demonstration of any of these negative feelings and acts is really a wake-up call for you to go immediately to prayer. 
to realign yourself with the truth of God's goodness, wholeness, and holiness in your life. We need to take really, a, to, to go on fast, you know, from, from negative news and negative uh, appearances and just say, I will today see, set our intention to see as God sees. You know, it's, it's, it's such an important aspect of our spiritual uh, activity and our spiritual practice. Early New Thought luminary Raymond Charles Barker, in an essay titled, You Can Be Healthy Today, posed the question, why do people get sick? And explains that there are many schools of thought on this. The medical profession gives us the material reasons. The psychologists give the emotional reasons. And orthodox theologians maintain you become ill because of sin. I'll never forget my first Sunday that I came here in 1981. That's what Reverend Emma was talking about. She talked about sin, which I thought I had invented, so I was so surprised to go somewhere and hear that there were other people. And she said that sin, of course, is a term from archery, which means that you have missed the mark. And she said, what do you do when you miss the mark? And I, I said from the back of the church, aim and fire again. And she said, you have got it. And I said, I'm coming back to this church. This makes sense to me. So. This idea that sin makes you sick makes me very nervous because, you know, I see so many people who, who are very healthy. Barker says very irreverently, sometimes there is no one healthier than a good sinner. But continuing his essay in a more serious vein, Barker writes, and I quote, you may be wondering why some people are well and others are not. Why some people triumph over disease and are healed completely and others can't seem to get better. It would be impossible he says, for anyone to be healed of anything if wholeness and health were not based on a principle. And a principle is a basic or fundamental truth, unquote, the underlying plan by which spirit and God operates in this universe. The, this past summer, when I had attended the CSL summer conference, in Park City, Utah, it was called SOAR, I met a remarkable woman who is living proof of what we're discussing, this idea that, that there's a principle of wholeness. And I, I, I really have to share it with you. We were at lunch, and she was an older woman, and she shared that she had obtained her master's and PhD degrees late in life. So another person at the table said, well, what kept you from, from you know, going for it uh, earlier? And she said, fourth stage pancreatic cancer. And she then told the story that she, she was diagnosed and the doctor lovingly gave her six months. So she said, I'll be back to see you in six months. And she said she went home and she journaled because her first reaction was six months. I haven't done my master's yet and I want my PhD. And she, she said she wrote that down and she, she called the university and, and began the process of applying to do her master's. And she also, uh, ignored the suggestions from all the various people who help you, you know, with the oncologists and the, the, um, the, the, the therapists and so on, who advised her that she should use her imagination to visualize herself shooting down the, um, the, the cancer cells, you know, you know, like shooting them, blasting them into oblivion. And she wrote in her, in her journal that if everything is God, then these cells are God also. And she said to herself, what I'm going to do is I'm going to befriend them. I'm going to make this cancer my friend. And she literally began to speak to it. So she'd say, let's go for a walk and get some morning air. And out on the walk, she would say, you know, you don't want to kill me, no, because if I die, you are going to die too. And that doesn't make sense, does it? So she, I mean, she just had this amazing attitude, meanwhile going through all of the arrangements to go to university to do her master's. Six months later, she walks into the doctor's office and friends, she wasn't in remission. There was no sign of the cancer and she remains cancer free today. I just thought, wow, I mean, you know, that's how the principle works. And I, I, I put in my own journal up in Park City, why am I so surprised? 
you know, because I'm not surprised or amazed or, or come to the podium and talk about it when I, I cut my finger in the kitchen and it heals. And it's the same principle of healing that operates, whether it be something we call big and, and you know, overwhelming, or it's a nick on your finger, a, a hangnail, or you've nipped yourself shaving or whatever. It's the same principle at work. So, you know, Jesus demonstrated through his many healings that this life principle inherent in every person does not recognize anything within the individual but that original perfection. And I have this mental image of, you know, a blueprint of perfection at the center of each one of us. It's like, it's like the blueprint of your home, you know, and it's, it's a beautiful home and it's, it's perfect. And you may neglect, as I often do, the cleaning and things run down or need painting or, or freshening up. Um, so the house or the home may look a little worn around the edges, but the blueprint is still what? Perfect. That nothing alters the perfection of that blueprint. And that is true of the original perfection that is our blueprint after which we are, the, the image of which we are created. So Holmes, Dr. Holmes writes that healing is not a process, it's a revelation. And he says, perfect God, perfect man, perfect being. You need not fully understand the how, the what, and the why of healing in order to accept your healing. All that you need to do is stand firm in your conviction that you are all that God is and that there is a blueprint of perfection at the center of your being. Do not postpone your good. Accept your divine identity and the ability this identity gives you to embody a quality of life that goes beyond the changeable facts you see. Let the truth, my friends, reflect in the way you live as you live the science of mind. Refuse to feel powerless. Refuse to, fe to feel less than whole. If you are in the habit of describing yourself in limiting terms and speaking about my allergies, my sinus problem, my arthritis, stop it. Don't own the arthritis and the allergies and the sinus problem. You know, we have a chant that captures this perfectly, and it goes, don't let anyone ever tell you that you are anything less than beautiful. Don't let anyone ever tell you that you are less than whole. How could anyone fail to notice that your loving is a miracle? How deeply you're connected to my soul. Can we play that, um, Valerie? Don't let anyone ever tell you. Don't let anyone ever that you are anything less than beautiful. Less than beautiful. Don't let anyone ever tell you that you are less than whole. How could anyone fail to notice that your loving is a miracle? How deeply you're connected to my soul. Sing it to someone. Don't let anyone ever tell you you are anything less than beautiful. Don't let anyone ever tell you you are less than whole. How could anyone fail to notice that your loving is a miracle? Friends, embrace the truth with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul, with everything you have got. Don't let anyone ever tell you that you are anything less than God in radiant expression. Don't allow yourself to give up when the appearances or condition appear to be regressing or persisting. Become like Jacob, who wrestled with an angel, and that angel represented the principle of life within you. Wrestle with that principle of life within you. Speak with it. Make it your friend. Speak to it every day until it blesses you with the wholeness 
That is your divine birthright. Namaste. Oh, I've forgotten, I've forgotten something. Verse, richer than all previous imaginings. Written in what some may believe to have been a simpler time, this work speaks to a future more complex time as well. Although Holmes uses use of language belongs to the 1920s and 30s, the ideas expressed remain larger than the constraint of words and even more relevant to today's necessity. Holmes seemed to anticipate the world of the new millennium with its compounding of factors unique to human experience. How can we deal with a world of whole system transition in which everything that we have known is changing at so rapid a pace that we are caught between the dangers that threaten us and the opportunities that beckon to us? Educated for the demands of a different time and culture, we are called to be re-educated to use more of ourselves in meeting the many new challenges that confront us. We have no choice then but to de democratize greatness and utilize the whole continuum of human and divine potential. The science of mind says that this is not only possible, it is what is expected of us. For the first time in human history, we are required as a species to extend ourselves into radically new ways of being. The tasks that are now ours, the tasks of virtual creation, compel the revolution in consciousness that tells us that we are part of the great unfolding of spirit in flesh. These are the times. These are the times. We are the people. The science of mind can help us do it. The science of mind can help us do it if we will but set our intention to live from the knowledge that we are the individualized expressions of something so awesome, something so beautiful, something so joyous that we can only stand in awe the majesty, beauty, and might of the divine presence expressing as each and every one of us. Namaste.